Hello again everyone, it's me Matt, appreciate you being here on my video today. We're talking about South African armoured fighting vehicles today, but before I get any further I'd like to do a massive thank you and shout out to Dr. DeWald Venter for sending me a book which is based upon this vehicle that we are going to talk about today and many other South African armoured vehicles. Part of the Africa at War series and produced by Helion and Company, South African Armoured Vehicles, A History of Innovation and Excellence, takes an in-depth look at 13 iconic South African Armoured Vehicles. The book shows the development of each vehicle, how it's rolled out in the form of its breakdown of its main features, layout and design, equipment, capabilities, variants and service experiences. Illustrated by over 100 photographs and more than 20 custom-drawn colour profiles, this volume provides an exclusive and indispensable source of reference for South African armoured fighting vehicles. And I must admit, I have read this book and it is a fantastic, very well-made book. And I'm going to be using it for the rest of my referencing for South African videos um, and vehicles that I will be doing in the future because it's just got so much good information. If you do have interest in going into find this book or wish to read it yourself or purchase it, I will leave a link in the description box below so that you guys can actually go take a look. And thank you again, Dr. Venter. Really is appreciated you uh, to actually send me this book to me to review. So today, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a development of a particular armoured fighting vehicle from South Africa, and that is the Oliphant series of main battle tanks. But before we get into the later variants of this vehicle, we do need to understand its predecessors and where it came from. The Oliphant Mark I Alpha MBT takes its Afrikaans name from the African elephant. The Oliphant is the largest land animal, and thus the Oliphant MBT is aptly named as it's the heaviest military vehicle in the South African Defence Force. The Oliphant is popularly referred to as Woomzy, a cartoon elephant of the 1980s fame, and I'm not too sure if I said that right, but I tried my best. Now, the Oliphant Mark I Alpha was the final evolutionary development of the British Centurions in South African service before the end of the Cold War. During 1953, South Africa, as part of the Commonwealth, purchased 87 Mark III and 116 Mark VI Centurions from Great Britain. The first Centurion, R74783, was received the same year at the Training School of Armour. During the 1960s, South Africa sought to purchase the Mirage fighter aeroplanes from France and sold 100 Centurions to Switzerland to generate the required funds. The vehicle overall was quite impressive. In 1964, the UN enacted voluntary arms embargo on South Africa though. Regardless of the sanctions, South Africa was able to obtain some of the equipment and parts necessary for the upkeep of the Centurion fleet, with the exception of the 650 horsepower, water-cooled V12 Rolls-Royce Meteor engine, which was prone to overheating in the warm African weather anyway. Furthermore, the strain brought on by the rocky terrain took its toll on the Centurion's road wheels and suspension. The changing global political environment against South Africa necessitated an increased requirement on the self-reliance which led to the establishment of the Arms Corps in 1964, which would take on procurement, research and development tasks. In 1973, Arms Corps acquired several air-cooled Continental V12 petrol engines used on the M46-47 patterns, which produced 810 horsepower. With some creative modifications, they were installed on the South African Centurions. However, the new engines were far from perfect and they consumed ridiculous amounts of fuel, limiting the operational range to just above 40 kilometers. Significant changes were made to the Oliphant, including the engine, main gun, 84mm to 105mm, diesel fuel tanks, driver control systems, ammunition storage, commander's cupola, upgraded gun control sites, air cleaners, communication systems, rotary juncturing box, explosion suppression system, engine exhaust smoke generator, and turret cooling fan, which is why a lot of people say, oh, it's just a Centurion. It's not. It has been quite heavily modified into its own variant that adapted it to become the Oliphant Mark I. It was sent to the South African Army School of Armour at Temper Military Base for testing in 1976 and followed by a second in 1977. The Oliphant is a prime example of what ingenuity and technical experience can accomplish. It took a time and effort to actually get this vehicle finished, and almost nothing, around 30% of the old Centurions remained except the characteristics of the hull, turret shells and track skirts. The Oliphant Mark I was officially introduced in 1978, and of course there was trials and developments of other vehicles around the world, including that of the T-55, which revealed several inadequacies of the Oliphant Mark I. Luckily, development of the Oliphant Mark I Alpha had already begun in 1981, and production actually starting in 1983. 
The new Oliphant Mark I Alpha upgrade of the Oliphant Mark I was ready for service in 1985 and featured a stabilised, locally produced 105mm GT3 52 caliber semi-automatic quick-firing gun. The fire control system was improved and a passive night vision sight on a night elbow was also installed and a laser rangefinder. The Oliphant Mark I Alpha became a true African MBT and is adapted to the suit of unique operational and tactical requirements found in South African battle space. With some creativity and ingenuity, the South African arms industry was able to upgrade a 40-year-old MBT into one that went toe-to-toe -to -toe against an enemy with numerically superior tanks. The Oliphant Mark I Alpha was soon to have a facelift in the form of the Mark I Bravo, but unlike before, the Mark I Bravo would be a complete rebuild which can face down and beat the potent T-72M. The Oliphant Mark I Bravo is a rebuild completely adapted for the African battle space and was based on lessons learned from that of the South African border war. The design only kept the turret mantlet, drive ring and hull sides, the bottom plates and the ring gear. Unlike the Mark I Alpha, which an upgrade from the Centurion Mark V and Mark VII hull, it was completely restarted from scratch. OMC set out to design the build of the interim MBT that would improve the shortcomings of the Mark I Alpha which were exposed during the South African border war, such as inadequate armour, poor mobility, improved firepower and taxing maintenance requirements. The Mark I Bravo was designed to face off against T-54, 55, T-62, T-72 MBTs which were equipped respectively with 100mm, 115mm and 125mm main guns. The primary focus therefore was placed on protection followed by improved firepower capabilities, then mobility and lastly reduction of overall vehicle maintenance and crew fatigue. A total of 44 Mark I Bravos will be built in two batches of 22 each starting in 1991. South Africa is the sole user of the Mark I Bravo of which 26 were upgraded to the Mark II standard in 2005. Presently remaining the Mark I Bs are the environmentally controlled warehouse storage in Walmanstal. Although the African battle space favours a wheel configuration, the Mark I Bravo was envisioned to retain its predecessor role as an MBT. It could forward up to 1.2 metres or 3.9 feet of water without preparation. With regards to the mobility overall, it kept the Continental 291 turbocharged V12 diesel engine of the Mark I Alpha. Improvements to the engine enabled an additional 200 horsepower, which totaled 950 horsepower, and raised the horsepower per ton from 13.39 horsepower per ton to 16.1 horsepower per ton, a necessary improvement considering that the Mark I Bravo weighed three more tons than that of the Mark I Alpha. There was also a new automatic transmission called the Armta 3, which was assembled by gear ratio and installed in the Mark I Bravo, which provided double differential steering, four forward gears and two reverse. The additional 200 horsepower and new automatic transmission allowed it to accelerate from 0 to 30 or 0 to 90 miles per hour in 11.5 seconds, which on flat terrain for a vehicle of this type is pretty good. The old Centurion Horseman suspension was replaced with a new torsion bar suspension system with hydraulic dampers, which provides an overall 300 to 400% improvement of wheel travel compared to that of the Mark I Alpha. Damn British engineering. Bump stops were fitted to all the road wheels in order to improve off-road mobility while the telescopic dampeners were fitted to the front and two back stations to reduce the rocking when stopping the tank. Steering is done via a yoke instead of tillers which is the old school way of driving tanks which personally I absolutely love. The fuel capacity was also increased from 328 gallons to 365 gallons. The MBT could travel 360 kilometers or 224 miles on road or 240 kilometers or 149 miles off road and 150 kilometers or 93 miles on sand which in Africa of course there is a lot of it. An interesting side note in terms of logistics for this vehicle, based on the lessons learned during the South African border war with the Mark I Alpha, the Mark I Bravo features two drinking water tanks, one left and one right inside the turret with a combined capacity of 101 litres or 26.8 gallons. The water can be accessed from the commander's and loader's station and reduces the necessity to leave the tank to fetch water, which of course once again in Africa it gets pretty warm. Fewer logistical tasks reduce the need for replenishment and administration and logistic support from vehicles from other echelons. The addition of a fume extractor fan helped clear the interior crew compartment of excess fumes of the main gun, and new and more comfortable seats were installed to help reduce crew fatigue. In terms of the main armament, the Mark I Bravo retained the South African produced 105mm GT3 52 caliber semi-automatic quick-firing gun manufactured by LEW. 
a new thermal sleeve and fume extractor helped improve sustained accuracy when firing and reduced barrel droop heat by as much as 70 to 90 percent. The ammunition that can be used is identical to that of the Oliphant Mark I. It should be noted that the M156 Hesh round is no longer used by the South African Defence Force, and similarly the M413 armoured piercing, fin stabilised, discarding Sabo Tracer is also no longer used as it was superseded by the M426 and the M9718. The tank was also equipped with one 7.62mm coaxial machine gun armed with around 2,000 ready rounds in a bin that replaced the 200 round boxes used by the Mark I Alpha. In 1990, the South African Defence Force tasked a new company to develop a new FCS to replace the 30 year old system of the Oliphant Mark I. The fire control system known as the HIFF consisted of a state of the art for the time ballistic computer system, sight drive, and electronics coupled to a touch button control system and sensors which actually measured the conditions of ambient temperatures to improve the fire accuracy of the main gun. The new system allowed the gunner to select a target in less than two seconds. The FCS would calculate a fire solution and notify the gunner via ready to fire light that the main gun was on target and ready to fire. In terms of protection, having established that the Oliphant Mark I was vulnerable to the main gun of the T-55, 62 and T-72 main battle tanks, the improvement in armor for protection was required heavily for the Bravo. The Mark I Bravo retained the original Mark I Alpha's armor with additional several passive composite armor packages over four frontal plates. A gap was left in between the original Mark I Alpha turret and the add-on turret package to act as spaced armor against high explosive anti-tank rounds which in Africa with RPGs was very high. Most of the information on this armor package was classified, however ballistic tests showed that it provided sufficient protection to defeat 150mm heat rounds used by T-62 tanks. Overall, the Mark I Bravo was, for practical purposes, a leap forward in protection, mobility and firepower over its predecessor, the Mark I Alpha. However, several problems came to light such as poor power to weight ratio and the failure of the main gun system to exceed the performance of the Mark I Alpha. Logistical shortcomings of the parts and maintenance manuals really exasperated the Mark I Bravo's problems. Additionally, to the desired fightability improvement was not really achieved. These shortcomings motivated the Defence Force to look for further improvements which led to the Oliphant Mark II. The official planned replacement of the Mark I Alpha was evaluated in the 1990s and possible contenders for it overall were the French tropicalised AMX 56 Leclerc developed for Saudi Arabia and the British Vickers Defence Systems Challenge 2E. Initial South African defence requirements asked for 96 new MBTs, 6 armoured recovery vehicles and 4 armoured fighting vehicles that could launch bridges or some of a similar body variant. However, in 1998 the South African government announced that no new MBT was to be funded for the foreseeable future. Originally, entirely new holes would have to be built due to the lack of funds. The only solution available was to upgrade the Mark I Bravos which were on hand to the desired specifications sought by the South African military. However, this would lead to the Oliphant Mark II, and a total of 26 of them were built from 2005 under Project Otalasa. The Mark II is in service only with the South African Defence Force. Four are used for training at the Army School of Armour at Temper Military Base, while the remaining 22 are in storage. The design and development of the production of the Mark II were undertaken to correct the shortcomings of its predecessor. It was particularly feared that the T-72M MBTs would be acquired by some of its neighbours, which would require a much more lethal South African MBT. For the Mark II, the engine was pretty much kept the same, however there were some improvements to the engine, which raised the overall horsepower to 1050, and with an increased power to weight ratio of 17.35 horsepower per tonne. In terms of the vehicle's main armament, it still retained the same GT3 52 105mm gun and the same coaxial machine gun. However, the Mark II features a wholly integrated FCS. The fire control system allows the gunner and commander to target an enemy which engages an auto tracking feature to keep the main gun on target while the tank is moving, similar to that of the hunter killer feature of the commander's independent thermal view of some of the tanks that we see today. The laser rangefinder is integrated into the system and is accurate up to 10km. Data from the rangefinder is then design fed into an integrated ballistic computer which applies elevation to the main gun. Tests revealed that the system was accurate within 30cm by 30cm at 2km. Most of the armour package for the Mark II was the same, however there was an upgrade program that took form of several passive composite armour packages, one over the frontal glacius plate and several on the turret, front, sides and top. 
a gap was left from the original Centurion turret and the added arm package to act as more spaced armour. The total thickness of the composition of this was also classified, however it was publicly stated that the Mark II's frontal armour could stop, again, the 115mm heat rounds used by the T-62. The entire hull can shrug off the feared 23mm AP rounds, and the threat posed to the Oliphant Mark I Alpha by the RPG-7 was negated when the upgrades were given to the Mark II armour. Additionally, the armoured steel skirts of the Mark I Alpha were redesigned for the Mark II to protect the running gear from incoming missiles that were prematurely detonating of incoming heat rounds. This constant threat of landmines as well in South Africa necessitated the addition of a double armoured floor with torsion bars between the floor plates reinforced. A new fire suppression system was also installed in the crew and engine compartments to reduce the likelihood of catastrophic fire of explosions when hit. Overall, the Mark II does address most of the shortcomings initially found with the Mark I Bravo to make the tank quite fightable and incorporating the hunter-killer capability. Furthermore, a more powerful engine improves the tank's overall performance. The Mark II was quite a leap forward in its protection and mobility for its time. Be aware that the role of MBTs in Africa was very different to that of what most of us think of today, and is essentially to act as a deterrent to outside aggressors using small armoured vehicles. Not that of gigantic, heavily armoured beasts that are able to stop armour-piercing fin stabilised discarding Sabo and other more complex anti-tank weapon systems. Primarily, these are more of a deterrent than anything else to soft-skinned vehicles or lightly armoured vehicles that could be highly strung across large areas of terrain and that don't require such large amounts of penetration to take them out. Be aware though that this fleet does still need to be replaced and the hulls are nearing about 50 years of age. It's safe to say that the Oliphant being, although quite the compressive tank of its time back in the day, has now become a very obsolete tank overall, and if it was to come against other main battle tanks of today, it would not do so great. But does it need to? In the context of what I just said, this vehicle was really designed to take out things like BMPs, soft skin vehicles. Infantry. It is not there to take out T90s, T80s, or more modern day variants of the tank. However, the T72M is still a formidable capability of knocking out this tank, which does give me a little bit of the heebie jeebies considering they're not doing a huge amount of upgrades to the armor of this vehicle to this day. So, quite a long winded video today, and one that spans across a whole family of this vehicle's generation. And I have to say, you know, considering this has come from a Centurion and been modified to the South Africans' needs wholeheartedly, I have a lot of respect for them. You know, why produce something that is so over the top that needs to be this heavy duty MBT? It doesn't need to be. And I respect that. I respect that they've gone for what is necessary, not what is, you know, wanted. And I have spoken to a few people who have actually operated these tanks before. They've reached out to me many times and saying, please make a video about the Elephant main battle tank. And I'm really glad I got round to it. Thanks again, Dr. Deval Venter, for doing this and allowing me to use your content to actually produce this video. Uh, but seriously, though, it does have a lot of respect of South African armored fighting vehicle crews out there. I know the Rukat uh, has a lot of respect out there as a wheeled variant. But for a tracked main battle tank, the Elephant holds its own. I hope you really enjoyed today's video. Please leave me a like if you did. I'd also love to hear your input and comments on this particular main battle tank series. If you do want to go check out that book, please go check out the description box below. Thank you again, Dr. Venter, for sending me this book so I could use it on this video. If you want to be notified of any upcoming content in the future, please click the little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified for videos next time. If you want to support my channel, you're more than welcome to go to the description box below also to check out my Patreon and PayPal, and I also have my PO box if you want to send any fan mail. Thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.